Welcome. We'll be starting with class 7 science, the 9th chapter. And now with every class, we'll be bringing some of the brain teasers. If you are able to solve these questions, I would say you are ready with your chapter. If not, go ahead and listen to the lecture so you would have more doubts that would be clarified. So these are some of the questions that I believe you should be able to address after you are done with this lecture. So just go through these questions for a while and see as we proceed whether you are able to go for the answers or find the answers for these questions or not. Still if not, you are free to go ahead and put those in the comment section and we'll be happy to discuss those again. So let's begin with the concept of soil. What, what is soil and what is the importance of soil? So, Initially, I can say it provides an anchorage to the plant. Now, once the plant is there firm in the soil, what would happen? The roots would penetrate down. These roots would slowly and gradually take the water and the nutrients with them, which we would study in chapter 11, where we would be talking about the transportation of the nutrients and the water in the plants. That's through the vascular tissue. So we won't go into that detail for this chapter. Let's wait for chapter 11 to come. Now here what would happen is as you go up these nutrients go and supply to the plant so the plant grows so soil I can say is essential for the process of agriculture to take place with this agriculture we get food we get shelter in the form of logs woods that is available we also get clothing that's from the cotton and the jute products that's there so this agriculture is essential and that that can happen through soil however in recent times we are talking about soilless agriculture what is that that is known as the science of hydroponics which we would understand later as we move to higher classes so that's basically agriculture without the presence of water. that's how we work around the development now when we are saying that this soil is essential what would happen if i cut out the relationship of the soil with the atmosphere let's say i have a polythene bag that's lying on the soil what would happen this soil would be devoid of oxygen since it's devoid of oxygen the plant would not be able to get the required nutrients the water that's there and ultimately it would lead to a dead soil now again this soil is divided into various horizons Horizons are the various layers of the soil that we can understand. This vertical arrangement of the soil structure is also known as soil profile. In this soil profile, the lowermost soil is what is known as bedrock. Now, this bedrock is a hard particle that's present on the lowermost layer. Above that, you have C horizon, B horizon, A horizon. A horizon is the topmost horizon. On the top of this A horizon, you have humus. Humus is the dead and the decaying organic matter that is present. This A horizon is considered as most fertile. You have numerous minerals that are found. It's dark in color because of the presence of humus. Below that you have B layer. This is comparatively less fertile. It has more amount of minerals. It's much more harder, compact, light and loosely arranged. Then you have C, further less fertile, presence of more minerals that could be seen and it's just above the bedrock. B horizon is considered to be intermediate between A and C. So the easiest way is to remember is ABC, the very simple way in which you can remember the soil profile. When we talk about the soil, there are various categories we can understand. One is the color of the soil. You must have seen black soil, red soil, alluvial soil. So these are various kinds of soils that are present. The next is by the particle size. So you have gravels which are bigger particles. So I can say 0.05 mm to 2 mm is the size of gravel. Then you have silt. Silt is somewhere from 0.002 to 0.05 mm and less than 0.002 mm is what is clay. So clay is the smallest, finest particle above which you have silt and above which you have gravel. Let's take a beaker. 
I put some soil, I stir it. What would happen after some time? I would see the, the soil settles down in the water and you would see the topmost layer which is humus. Below humus you would see a layer of water. Below water you would see the smaller particles which is clay, then silt and then gravel and finally bigger pebbles if any. So that's how we arrange the soil into the size that's seen. So arrangement of the soil based on the size is very very uh, important. Now how does the nature of the soil that's being formed depends. In the previous classes and in geography, we have talked about the three types of soil. We have the igneous soil, sedimentary soil and metamorphic soil. Metamorphic soil is the soil that's basically due to high pressure and temperature on either an igneous soil or a sedimentary soil. As a result, you have metamorphic rocks that are formed. Now these rocks over a period of time start to break down. So there are two processes that are seen. Breaking of the rock is what is known as weathering and moving away of that rock particle is what is known as erosion. So erosion and weathering together are what is known as denudation. These are the soil forming processes. Now once you have the soil that's formed, we try to understand that this soil is essential for the growth and the development of the plant. So we'll understand how we move around the various types of soil. In this lecture, we would be focusing on three types of soil, sandy soil, clay soil and loamy soil. Before that, let's understand three important concepts. Those are porosity, permeability and capillarity. A very important uh, question, uh, question that we have put up in the brain teaser and a very important concept to understand. What is porosity? Let's say I have the particles that are present here. Now these particles have intermittent space. This space is what is known as pores and this is what is known as porosity. So if the particle size is bigger, you might have more pores that could be seen. So I can simply put low porosity implies low permeability, but high porosity need not necessarily imply high permeability. We'll understand this in a while. Now porosity we have talked about, that's the presence of the pore within the rocks or within the soil rather I would say. What is meant by permeability? Permeability means whether these pores are interconnected or not. So let's say if this pore is interconnected to this and this pore is further interconnected to the next pore and this is further interconnected to the next. I can say this is a highly permeable soil because each of the pores are interconnected from the top and therefore I can say there is high permeability. But as I said, it's not required that once you have bigger amount of pores that are seen, the permeability is also higher. For example, the vesicular volcanic rock, if we go into that detail, we would see that they have huge amount of pore spaces that are there. But these pore spaces are independent. They are not connected with one another. And since they are not connected with one another, I can say it implies that high porosity need not necessarily mean high permeability. Hope that's clear. The next point is capillarity. What is capillarity? Capillary action works through surface tension. So what would happen when these pores that are seen, the interconnections of the pores, they get thinner, what would happen? Water rather than moving through the action of gravity would start to move through the action of surface tension and that is what is known as capillarity. Now this capillary movement could be in any direction, it could be downwards, it could be upwards or it could be sideways. So that's how we understand capillarity. Now. Let's talk about the various soils one by one. So let's start with sandy soil. Definitely bigger particle size, so larger spacing, higher amount of porosity that's seen. It's well aerated and it's light and dry in color. The next is clay soil. Here, very interesting concept. You have smaller particle size that is seen. As you have a smaller particle size that is seen, it has a capability to hold more amount of water that is present and here comes our brain teaser which says is clay soil highly porous and less permeable? So yes, it is highly porous but it is less permeable because the interconnections between those are weak and therefore we say the permeability of a clay soil is less 
as compared to other soils and lastly we have the loamy soil this soil is considered the best topsoil for the plant growth as we have the question in the brain teasers now this loamy soil is a mix of sand silt and clay what would happen is as the river or the water moves on you would have the soil that is accumulated and between this soil you have a soil which is intermediate to a sandy soil and a clay soil which is very good or has a right water retention capacity or water holding capacity we can demonstrate this with an experiment so i have three samples in the test tube i have uh, in the funnel i have basically three soil samples i pour the water what would happen as you can see in this picture maximum water collects in the sandy soil and that's how we can prove that sandy soil has the minimum water holding capacity and maximum water basically moves down so percolation is highest in the case of sandy soil so maximum water is moving down through the pores and that's how we define percolation so percolation is highest in the sandy soil and lowest in the clay soil again Uh, we have a very good example to demonstrate it in the rural areas as well as the urban areas so rural areas you have kachcha road when you have a kachcha road what would happen the water would easily penetrate down the road however in an urban area there is a concrete or an asphalt road what would happen the water would not be able to percolate down as a result in the rainy season you can see there are flash flooding that occurs and this flash flooding is a result of the lower rate of water absorption or the lower rate of percolation that seen the next is soil definitely has moisture so let's do a simple experiment i take some soil in a beaker and i heat it on the surface of the inner surface of the beaker you would see small droplets that are seen this proves that the soil had moisture in it which on heating evaporated now again what's important is this soil which is heated becomes loose so that's again a indication of the fact that the soil has moisture this amount of moisture varies from soil to soil so for example the amount of moisture in the sandy soil would be less as compared to a clay soil again a good demonstration would be to have a vision on a hot day so hot summer day what would happen is you would see the vapor that basically reflects the sunlight and the air above the soil slowly and gradually begins to shimmer out so that's one of the demonstrations to explain the real demonstration to explain the presence of moisture in the soil there are two units that we talk about one is mass the other is weight so when we talk about mass we talk about the units of grams and kilograms however when we talk about weights we talk the uh, talk about the unit of weight so mass of 1 gram how much that weighs is the gram weight that is taken into account soil is there this soil is apt for growing plants but different plants require different kind of soil for example i cannot say that uh, the rice can grow well in a desert area similarly the cactus cannot survive in a coastal area what is required is a different type of climate for different type of vegetation or agriculture to take place the most important agriculture that we talk about is mainly on the clay and the loamy soil so clay and the loamy soil are considered best for various uh, cereals lentils and so on so let's explain or understand one by one rice which is also known as paddy goes well in the clay soil where the organic matter content is very very good lentils grow well in a loamy soil where water can easily be uh, drained or water holding capacity is good cotton goes in sandy loamy soil or a loamy soil which can again hold a lot and lot of water wheat goes well in a very finely chopped or very finely kept clay soil so smaller fine particles are required for the wheat crop to take place good humus content increases the fertility of a wheat soil a good example is understanding some of the soils with the recent government schemes we have come across the soil health card scheme so we are talking about assessing the quality of soil some of the soils are very very acidic since they are acidic they are not good for the plants to grow the acidity or the basicity is measured on a ph scale ranging from 0 to 14 where we consider 7 as neutral less than 7 is acidic more than 7 is considered basic 
If we have a soil sample which is acidic, we would prefer that it moves towards neutral or basic in order to sustain a good crop. So what is mixed in it? So again, it's a kind of brain teaser question. So whatever is basic would be mixed. So we can mix the quick lime, we can mix a slaked lime. Those are good examples of understanding this question. A very interesting concept, the Sohagpuri pots. These Sohagpuri pots are famous throughout the region of Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. And these pots have been specially designed to keep the water very, very cool. To loosen out the soil particles, you have burnt horse dung which is mixed into the soil. As a result, the soil particles get loose, the water evaporates more quickly. The evaporation of water, more the evaporation of water, more the cooler the container it is. So, surahis, earthen pots and kalas which are the frying pans are made up of these Sohagpuri uh, uh, basically persons who make these. So, again a very important question that's up. The soil erosion we have already talked about. This is the removal of the top layer. You already understand that weathering is the breaking of the rock particles and movement of this rock particles, removal of this top layer leads to soil erosion. What would happen, let's say this is a mountain with a gentle slope, we are not talking about a steep slope. You have the rainfall, the soil starts to move from the upper layers to the lower altitude. As a result, this region would be devoid of good soil. So good vegetation cannot sustain in this region. The anchorage of the roots would become less firm. As a result, you would have lesser vegetation, lesser uh, good quality of vegetation, more of deforestation that would be seen. And this region where you have the soil that comes up and settles down would be a region of intense or good agriculture, good fertility that would be witnessed. India is a unique land where you have numerous rivers that flow through. So Ganga Brahmaputra Delta, so this is Ganga and this is Brahmaputra taking a U-turn from Arunachal Pradesh. The region where they merge is the uh, Sundarpans, that's basically in the part of India, West Bengal and parts of Bangladesh. Along this Ganga or any other river that's flowing across any of the countries, you have alluvial deposits. These alluvial soil are considered as one of the most fertile soils. But in some regions, you have water logging that takes place. Because of this water logging, what would happen? Again, it's very similar to what we understood in the example of the polythene over a soil. So this water would basically cut the oxygen link between the soil and the air. As a result, the soil would become dead and you would have very poor vegetation that would be witnessed. If there is a very dense forest, the soil erosion rate, how it would be affected? The rate of soil erosion in a very dense forest would decrease because whatever the rainfall is there would be absorbed mainly by the top canopy. As a result, very less water would go to the ground and the rate of erosion would automatically decline. So that's very, very important to understand. You often have heard stories or if you are in a village, you might have seen farmers digging the soil. Why, why does this digging help the soil? With this digging, the aeration increases. You have more porosity that's developed. As a result, the percolation of the water increases. Also, one very important phenomena is with digging of the soil, you have the weeds. Weeds are the undesired plants. These undesired plants can be removed from the soil very easily. And whatever nutrients are there would be available for the actual plant that it is there and it's required for. One important case study that we need to understand here is the presence of bore wells. We have seen that in the rural areas, the bore wells can go much more, uh, in the urban areas, the bore wells go much more deeper as compared to rural areas. Why does it happen? First of all, there is depletion of the water resources in the urban areas. Again, this urban areas are unable to basically replenish the water. Since you have the asphalt road that is present there, the percolation of the water is not there. In the rural areas, you have kacha road and percolation of water takes place. As a result, the groundwater table is usually higher. Here, the groundwater table drops down significantly because you do not have any water that is going through the percolation system. 
the depletion is very high so bore wells when they are dug in urban areas have to be much more deeper as compared to the bore wells which are dug into a rural area so those were some of the very interesting facts that we have come across i hope by now you are able to solve all the brain teaser questions that we have looking forward to have the next class with you enjoy and have a great day ahead